Okay, after all of that preliminary, as I say, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, first about the spiritual disciplines in general, again, kind of a, a little bit of this is a, is a reminder of what we've been talking about. Some of it has to do with uh, kind of having a, a clear spiritual picture of what we're talking about. And then I want to talk about some practical aspects of what it means to have a devotional life. In the last term in our class on how to study the Bible, we defined it in devotional, uh, a devotional life as being a regular, systematic commitment to reading God's Word, meditating on it, and praying. That's all still true. But I think the next level of devotional life for us in the context of the course that we just had is to add to that the other spiritual disciplines of the church. When I say of the church because the Holy Spirit, I believe, has given the church an understanding of disciplines like fasting and silence and solitude and stewardship. And they have proven over the last 2,000 years to be critical in our ability to grow to be more like Jesus. They are very practical ways in which we can achieve the desires of our heart. And the desires of our heart is part of what I want to talk about. The one way in which I want to make clear, uh, the Catholic Church has been responsible for the development of many of these disciplines. Um, and much of that in a very good way. But there are some ways in which the Catholic Church's practice of spiritual disciplines has not been the best. One of them is there has typically been a sense in the Catholic tradition that the practice of the spiritual disciplines were for those people who were more spiritual, who were monks or nuns <clears throat> or priests, that it really was a matter of being a professional Christian <laughs> to pursue these kinds of, these kinds of uh, practices. That's, that really is fairly consistently what the Catholic Church has been about. There's not been a tendency to, for the Catholic Church to encourage lay people to practice these disciplines nearly as much. A couple of them more institutionalized, like fasting during Lent or not eating meat on Fridays or whatever. Um, but they became kind of rote. But overall, the idea of, of growing spiritually through these things has been much more a professional, you know, Christian uh, kind of approach. We believe as Protestants, and because we believe in the priesthood of all believers, um, that this is for all of us. That this is something that we all should experience as part of what it means to be Christian. Not just if you are uh, dedicated and, and ordained into a professional Christian position. Okay? Well, let me talk a little bit about, again, the, the desires of the heart. The question that we've talked about here, um, we've asked it a couple of different ways, but uh, including how can we claim the, you know, the kind of life that Jesus talked about in the Spirit in, in the New Testament. For us, in a very practical kind of way, I think we ask ourselves, if we're honest, um, does God's presence in my life change anything for me? Am I different? Do I live differently? Do I experience life differently? Because of the fact that I say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately for many people, the, the difficulties of life, okay, the pressures, the hustle and bustle, I have to earn a living, I have to work, my boss is a jerk, you know, my 16-year-old daughter won't speak to me every time I try, she slams the door and stomps out. I mean, all of the real difficulties of life tend to want to squeeze out the spiritual aspects of our lives. And so we're left asking the question, is this practical in some way? Does this really help me as I seek how to live life in the way that God would want me to live? How I can be more like Jesus in how I live my life? Well, I believe that a real key to that, how do we get to that sense that God's presence in my life really does make a difference in the practical way I experience life, that, that lock, if you will, the key to that for 2,000 years, the church has said, has been the practicing of the spiritual disciplines. By practicing these spiritual disciplines, we come to a place where we have a greater intimacy of God, a greater experience of God, and that, that then will give us the context by which we can deal with the real, very practical, real difficulties of life. This is not just an esoteric, you know, uh, pie in the sky, by and by kind of thing. This should make a difference in our lives if we understand it correctly. I want to read to you a passage. This is the message, you know, a message by Eugene Peterson, a translation that he did. Uh, this is Jesus speaking in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. And you'll probably recognize this passage. This is probably different words than you usually hear it. But this is how uh, Eugene Peterson translated that. Jesus says, Are you tired? 
worn out, burned out on religion, come to me. Get away with me and you'll discover and recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. This is the passage we usually think, come, come to me all you who are uh, heavy laden and I will give you rest. Continuing Eugene Peterson's translation, walk with me and work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Okay, who doesn't want that, right? <laughs> the spiritual disciplines, we believe, are something the Holy Spirit has given to the church that allows us to experience life like that. To break through from just saying, I believe in Jesus and I know I'm going to heaven, to say this, how do I learn what it means to actually be present with, keep company with, be blessed by Jesus, to learn to live freely and lightly throughout all the difficulties of life. Because let's face it, life is hard. How do we deal with that? What is it about our Christian faith that should allow us to deal in a different way with that than people who don't have that grace in their lives? So much of it, I think we have to recognize that if you desire this, I mean, I read this passage from the message, and in half a dozen of you are going, yeah, yeah, that's what I want. The very fact that you desire that, that there is something in you that, that hearkens to that and wants that, is in itself a sign that the Holy Spirit is present in you. And the Holy Spirit is beckoning you to that kind of life. You've already started the process, in other words. Even if you've never tried to pursue any of the spiritual disciplines we talked about, the very fact that that sounds wonderful to you, that that idea of being, of being able to live a different kind of life, that in itself, that desire, is a sign that the Holy Spirit is always working in you. The simple desire that there should be something more. Okay? That there's, there should be a different way to deal with this stuff. C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with desires that nothing in this world can satisfy, then perhaps it is because we were made for a very different kind of world. God created us for a world that was not fallen, that was not hard, that did not have sin and evil and brokenness and grief and death in it. That's what we were made for. It was our own sinfulness that caused it to be as hard as it is. And yet something in us cries out for a different kind of life. And God the Holy Spirit causes us to, to still desire that, not only because of that spark of God that's in it, but because He wants us to have that now. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He wasn't just talking, well, we don't have a more abundant eternal life. That very expression means he wants us to have a more abundant life now. He wants us to experience what it means to be his children, you know, God's children, now. Uh, Blaise Pascal said there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person, meaning a vacuum and emptiness that only God can fill. St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. All of these are, C.S. Lewis, Pascal, Augustine, are all saying basically, we have a desire for God in our hearts. The Holy Spirit gave it to us. The Holy Spirit desires for us to find satisfaction for those desires. But to do so, we have some responsibility to put ourselves in a place to, to uh, give ourselves, through the disciplines, a focus and a direction to, to make ourselves open so that God can bless us in those ways. All right? Jesus himself, throughout all of his ministry, he recognized these hidden desires and desperations in the people that he ministered to. When we read in the Gospels, if you start noticing, over and over and over again, Jesus asked in one way or another, what is it you want? All right? Um, in John 137, he asked the, the first disciples who, um, you know, Andrew, and um, when they first started following him from John, he turns around and says, what do you want? And they said, oh, uh, 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 we were wondering where you're staying. <laughs> okay. And Jesus said, come and follow me and see. Okay. He was asking a question that was much deeper than what they perceived. And he was giving an answer already at that point, much deeper than what they expected. 
Later on, Jesus says, what is it that you want? What do you want me to do for you? Do you want to get well? He asks, you know, the, the uh, leper. And on and on and on. Jesus is always asking people in one, one phrase or another, what is it you really want? And I think we have to ask ourselves that question because until we recognize that there is some desire that we have, we're never going to find out what the satisfaction for that desire is. We desire more of God. We desire more of the presence of God. We desire to experience more of the love of God. That's what we want. And yet we have to be clear that's what we want. And then we have to be intentional about letting God give that to us. God never forces himself on anybody. He will only respond when we allow him to influence us. It's not because he can't. It's because he won't. He respects us more than that. And yet again, over and over and over, Jesus will say to people, what do you want? And when they're able to tell him what they want, he gives it to them. The very Lord's Prayer, you know, sort of the, the, the mark of what it means in terms of what's in, in, uh, involved in the Lord's Prayer, what the content says, uh, of what it means to be in fellowship with God, our Father who art in heaven, the idea of that relationship and of God being involved in everything, providing our food, forgiving us of our sins, protecting us from the devil, all of that's in the Lord's Prayer. That was in response to a request by one of the disciples, one or more, that they wanted to know what it meant to be in relationship with God the Father the way Jesus was. It was an expression of a desire for more. That's why they said, Lord, teach us to pray. We want to have what you've got. We want to have this desire we feel satisfied and answered. And Jesus always gave an answer. He always met the need when it was articulated. Now, for over 2,000 years, the church has recognized that there are certain intentional practices and relationships and experiences that we can pursue that will make it, that will not make it, they will not make us better. They will not give us what we want, but they will open us in such a way that then the Holy Spirit can give us the desires of our hearts, can satisfy the need within us will teach us what it means to be in company on an ongoing basis with Jesus. Um, we see an example of that in the early church. The description of the early church at the end of the second chapter of Acts, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, you know, this is study, uh, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. From the very earliest description we have of the church, they are practicing disciplines like prayer, like study, like you know, sharing of communion, uh, fellowship, which is listed as one of the disciplines in many people's lists. They were practicing these kinds of disciplines in order to grow in their understanding and knowledge, but especially in, their in the fulfillment of their desire to be closer to God, to be more like Jesus. Throughout all of the centuries since then, the practices of prayer, confession, worship, stewardship, fellowship, service, scripture, those have taught people what it means to be more like Jesus. They have drawn people more into his fellowship. They have satisfied the yearning of people's hearts to be experiencing more of God all the time. And we have that opportunity. Now again, practicing those disciplines will not itself give you that satisfaction. In fact, more likely than not, they will become burdens to you if you try to do them by force of will. You can only do it as a response to what the Holy Spirit is placing as a desire in your heart. And only then will it become something that is not only fulfilling, but exciting. Something that you, you want to experience more and more of. Too often in the history of the church, people have practiced the disciplines for all the wrong reasons. They thought they would get spiritual credit with the, you know, with the spiritual authorities, or that it would give them some kind of success, or approval, or respect, or something else. None of those reasons for practicing the spiritual disciplines will give you any satisfaction at all. The only thing that will give you satisfaction is to respond to a desire to be closer to God, more like Jesus, that the Holy Spirit puts in your heart. Without the Holy Spirit, none of this is going to make any sense, ultimately. You don't get brownie points for just doing these things. You have to be responding to a desire that's in your heart. And the first step with spiritual disciplines, if you do not feel that desire, is to ask God to give you that desire. That's the first thing. 
And then when you feel that desire to experience more of God, to experience more of His love, to be more like Jesus, to be in fellowship with God in, a, in an intimacy you haven't experienced before, when you feel that desire, then the practice of the disciplines in obedience to God will allow you to hear God responding to that desire. And you will grow in it. So when we ache for change, when we long for a sense of belonging in the presence of God, when we feel desperate with the pressures of life, that's exactly when we feel the need. And we should say, Lord, I want more. Life should be more than this. I want more of you. <clears throat> Help me with that. And then to put ourselves in a place. The spiritual disciplines are way, are, are way of us saying, okay, Lord, I'm prepared to do my part. I am prepared to offer myself lovingly and obediently to you. I am prepared to find time, first off, to set aside for you that idea of vacari deo, to be open to God, to be available to God, even literally to be on vacation for God. I am setting aside time because I desire to be closer to you, and I want you to fill that time with your own self so that I can grow to love you more and feel more of your presence in my life. That's what the spiritual disciplines are for. It's us doing our part simply by saying, I'm opening myself to you. It's not works righteousness. We're not earning anything. We're just putting ourselves in a position where we can be blessed. It's, it's like the old joke, which I think I told, if not in this class, in one of the classes before, guy was praying to God, you know, Lord, let me win the lottery. If you let me win the lottery, I will I'll spend the money for good. I'll bless people with it. I'll do good things. Lord, let, let me win the lottery. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed, Lord, let me win the lottery, let me win the lottery, Lord, please, please, and he did win the lottery. And after doing this for months and months and years even, he comes back again and says, God, I don't get it. I have been asking you over and over and over again to let me win the lottery because I will use that money for good, and yet you don't let me win. And God said, well, you could at least buy a ticket. <laughs> In a very real way, us practicing the spiritual discipline is, is our way of buying a ticket. It's our way of saying, Lord, we really want this. And we want to put ourselves in a position where you can bless us. And the spiritual disciplines are buying the ticket. Unless we are willing to invest at least that much, then we should not be shocked when we don't have a deeper and more intimate experience of God. All right? Um, it's also true, we need to say, because we talk about these as spiritual disciplines. A lot of people do have the sense, and because they've been abused, they've been wrongly used. There are spiritual disciplines that some people believe are legitimate, which include flagellation, beating yourself, which include, you know, uh, doing yourself damage as though that were going to gain something spiritually. Discipline, spiritual disciplines are not the same as disciplining a child who has done something wrong. This is simply a commitment of our will voluntarily to open ourselves to God and to His blessing and to His intimacy. And yet so many people have this idea that it's something harsh. It's not. It is The spiritual disciplines are grace-filled things. There are ways of opening ourselves so that God can show us His grace and His mercy and His love and the intimacy that He desires for us even more than we desire for Him. So we need to make sure that we don't get hung up simply on something like the fact that it's a discipline. And that we don't beat ourselves up when we don't accomplish as much spiritual growth as we want to over a given period of time. Uh, part of the process as well, and one of the reasons I think people struggle with not being more successful in spiritual disciplines, is that they don't take seriously the fact that this is going to change you. And that one of the things that you need to be aware of before you really pursue the spiritual disciplines in a serious way is you need to have some sense of who you are and where you are. Uh, John Calvin said, without knowledge of self, there can be no knowledge of God. Nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. So we, as we open ourselves to God for this blessing, we have to be serious about who we are and where we are. Meaning we have to be serious about our own sinfulness. We have to be serious about our own inability to make ourselves better. We have to confess our own brokenness and lostness. You know, it, it can be, St. John of the Cross wrote about the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul is very simply, when you confess your sins and you really are aware of your sinfulness and your failing, that such that it uh, required the sacrifice of Jesus, 
before we can fully experience the blessing of grace, we need to be fully aware of just how dark and sinful we really are at our core. And some of that is necessary as we advance. And you will experience some of that dark night of the soul as you advance in the spiritual disciplines. As we experience more of the holiness and light of God, we will become more aware of the darkness and unholiness of ourselves. Not that that's the point, not that we're going to dwell on that, but we will experience that. All right? and, and we need to, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, you know, uh, grace is free, but it is not cheap. And we always have to remember that a heavy price was paid for our sin, for our failing, for our darkness. And we need to not dwell on it or beat ourselves up for it or think that we're uh, unredeemable because we have been redeemed. But we do need to be honest with who we are and what we bring to God as we seek intimacy with Him and His blessing. Okay? Any questions about any of that? I want to spend a few minutes now talking about some fairly practical, here's how you need to pursue a devotional life. Again, for those of you who took the How to Study the Bible, I talked about a devotional life there. This is very much the same. I even just adapted some of the slides. But, but it's more. Okay. Studying God's Word and meditating on it, reading it, studying it, meditating on it, and praying about it is the start. And that's an obligation for every Christian. Every Christian. I think that we should all be prepared, now that you know, to go the next step by seeking intimacy with God, but the other spiritual disciplines beyond intake of God's Word and meditation on it and praying on it. And that would be fasting and silence and solitude and stewardship and service and some of the others we've talked about. Okay. So let's talk about a practical approach to building our devotional life. First, what is a devotional life? Uh, devotional life could be defined as the practice of the spiritual disciplines, especially Bible study, prayer, and meditation. That's the start. The intake of God's Word since we're talking about wanting to be more intimate with God, one of the first requirements is that we know more of God. And where do we find more of God? Basically, it's in Scripture. And so that's where we start. That is the, that is the foundation on which everything else is built, I believe. So, especially Bible study, prayer, and meditation that is centered on God and is intended to prove our, improve our relationship with God and to make us more aware and responsive to God's leading in our lives. Now, when I say here, intended to improve our relationship with God, that doesn't mean win God's favor, or get on his good side, all the favor we require for salvation was given to us in Jesus Christ. This is an issue of developing intimacy with someone. Okay. Um, when Carolyn and I got married, we loved each other. Our marriage was legal. It was solid. Everything was good. But over the last 18 years, we have grown much closer to each other. We understand more of each other. We can finish each other's sentences. You know, we... Etc. 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 That's what we talk about when we mean improving our relationship with God. We are wedded to God. We are saved if we've accepted Jesus Christ. Our relationship is assured, but we can still grow in it. Like any relationship can improve and grow as you learn more of the other person and experience more time in, in fellowship and relationship. Okay. Uh, in terms of principles of a devotional life, the first one is. And this is basic to everything we believe as Christians. We, all human beings, whether they realize it or not, are made for fellowship with God. And, again, to quote Augustine, our hearts are restless until they rest in Him. That's why we were made. That's why we have that desire. That's why every culture in history, as far as we can tell, has always had a sense there's something wrong with us. There is something broken in us. There is something missing in us. Well, we know what that is. That is that we were made for a purpose. We were made for a relationship with God. That relationship was broken, and it is only by Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, is the union back between God and humanity possible. Okay. That's the principle, first principle of a devotional life. The second principle is that fellowship with God, like with any other person, requires effort. We must be willing to spend time together, to talk to God, to listen to God, to interact with Him, to respond to His direction in our life. You can never grow any kind of relationship if you don't set aside time for it. It doesn't work. The third principle is a devotional life is more than just Bible study, although it starts there. Hearing God's Word in Scripture, and, and remember we experience God's Word both by reading it and also by hearing it. That's why gathering for worship and for, for church service is important. We experience God's Word by reading it first, by hearing it, 
then we get to points of meditation on it, etc. But the primary way we intake God's Word is reading it and hearing it. And that's foundational to everything else in terms of spiritual practices. Because that's where God has told us who He is. He's told us who we are. And He's told us how those two things fit together. God and us. Uh, my preaching teacher, Ian Pat Watson, uh, in seminary, he said that a preacher, if they do their job right, you tell two stories. God's story and our story. And especially how do those two stories meet. Uh, that's preachers or teachers, you know, Christian preachers or teachers who don't, who people feel, I don't, you know, it's completely irrelevant to me. It's because they forget the people story. Or those who, who preach or teach and they forget the God story, then it all becomes just humanism. It all becomes just talking about the human condition. Our, we have two parts uh, is in our job. Telling of God's story, telling of our story, and how those things fit. Well, that's exactly the case in terms of our understanding of what our lives are. We learn of God in Scripture. We apply it to our lives. Those two stories come together. And the last, last point of building a devotional life is that in addition to Bible reading and study, a meeting, meaningful devotional life also should include, I think I said must here, include prayer, meditation, fasting, silence, and uh, solitude, service, and stewardship. And almost, uh, almost more than even any of those, the practicing of the presence of God. The, I've had several people tell me they never really understood the passage in Scripture that says pray without ceasing until they heard the concept of practicing the presence of God, which simply means recognizing that God is there with you all the time and talking to Him about everything. Of recognizing and communicating with God constantly on an ongoing basis. I mean, not so that people think you're nuts, you know, not, not so that you don't listen to anybody else and you're just talking about <laughs> That's not what that means. It means, in a very mature and sensible way, that God is right here. He sees everything. He hears everything. I can be communicating with Him all the time. If I'm not sure what to do, God, I'm not sure what to do here. What should I do? It's as simple as that. It's not complicated. That is one of the most advanced ways in which we can practice, I think, the, the devotional life. Okay? Now, I want to give you some fairly practical uh, elements for a devotional life. In other words, how we proceed with it. First, first, we need to make a commitment. Um, again, from the How to Study the Bible, we talked about there that breaking an old habit, studies have shown that to break an old habit requires 21 days. It also requires 21 days to create a new habit. You know, if you're wondering why you haven't been able to get the habit of exercising. Well, until you can make yourself do it for 21 days in a row, then it starts becoming something that you have a natural desire to do. And that there's even theories that this involves sort of repatterning synapses in the brain to be able to have a sense of appropriateness about doing something. So if you have old habits that you need to break and new habits, the spiritual disciplines that you need to make, it may require you, before you have a really productive devotional life, you may need to be prepared to commit 42 days to it. 21 days to stop doing a lot of the stuff you're doing now that's getting in your way, and 21 days to start doing some of the things you need to start doing. And one of the reasons I put it that way is to say, give yourself a, a little bit of a break here. You, know, just, you leave this class, and by Tuesday of next week, you do not have a fully developed, fully functional you know, completely blessed by God's spiritual life. Uh, no, you're not going to. Be a little more realistic than that. Also, it's critical for us to establish our priorities. Again, this is something we've talked about in another class before. You should write down, make this, make this a, one of your first disciplines here. Write down in one paragraph what you want from a personal devotional life. What do you want to change? What do you want in terms of experience intimacy with God? And then, and then, after you've written down what you want, pray about and think about what do you think God wants in your devotional life? Remember, the source of all of this is that God wants to be in fellowship with us. He wants intimacy with us. That's why Jesus died on the cross, is to make that possible again. So write a paragraph in which you say what do you want from a personal devotional life, a practice of the spiritual disciplines, and then a paragraph that says what you believe God wants, and then invite God the Holy Spirit to help you fulfill that. We always have to remember that this doesn't work unless God the Holy Spirit is active in our hearts and in our lives. He can bring us to satisfaction in these things. 
And then you need to set aside the time. You need to find time to do this. Um, anything, anything you value, whether it be improving your golf game or your bridge game or your chess game or having a garden or you know, training your dog or whatever it is, you've got to set aside time. Duh. We all know that. How is it we think we're going to have a more intimate relationship with God if we don't set aside some time in order to pursue it? How are you going to have a better relationship with a friend unless you make time to spend with that person? So anything you value must be given priority. You need to set aside time to commit to growing your devotional life, to schedule it and keep it. I've got SBL there. I've told the story of um, one of the pastors at University Press. A friend of mine became his assistant. And she, people were always calling to schedule appointments. And on his book, he would have three or four times a day, he would have 15 to half minutes to a half an hour set aside that said SBL. And so Marta went to, to, uh, to him and said, um, people are asking for your time, and I need to schedule this stuff. These things that say SBL, can I move those? And by the way, what is that? Well, it meant, and he smiled and said, no, those, those are not movable. Those are locked in. And SBL means stand before the Lord. Three or four times a day, he had it on his calendar that he would take 15 minutes or half an hour to simply be in the presence of God and ask God to be present and evident to him. And he did that in the middle of a busy day every day. That's what it means to set aside time. Now put it in your calendar that God gets an appointment with you. Okay. A fourth thing, in terms of practical approach or element, is find a place for you, especially for practices like Bible study, uh, to uh, meditation on God's Word, prayer. Any place that's quiet and private will do, but you need to find a place that is a regular place for you, and you need to use it and set your time. As I say, when we have our, our wonderful new church, there's going to be a chapel in that church that is going to be a quiet place. And there are going to be seats there, and when people come to church, if they want a quiet place, if they want some place that they know that they can, can sit and read God's Word and pray and meditate, that's a place they can do it. We're going to set that aside. Um, but you need to find your place. Maybe a place in your home, and maybe a place at LCS, whatever. Find your place. You also need to make a plan, a specific plan. Now first, have a Bible reading and study plan. And also have a prayer list. Focus on God and your growth in Him, not on numbers. And then, once you've established a clear Bible, Bible reading and study plan, a clear prayer list, you then need to start, and I recommend that you start introducing the other aspects of, of spiritual discipline. If you have never before fasted, if you've never before experienced silence and solitude or stewardship in terms of giving, you know, 10% or more to the things of God, don't try doing all of those things this Sunday all at once. Your head will explode. <laughs> oh. Start, if, you, if you've never done it before now, I'm saying, start with reading God's Word and studying it with prayer, and then begin one at a time to start adding the other disciplines. Add times of silence and solitude. Begin to practice fasting once a week, for instance, where you, you, you fast after lunch one day through lunch the next day. So you basically fast from supper through lunch the next day, and then you eat supper. Try, even if it's skip one meal, if you're having trouble with that. But start slowly and add the disciplines and ask God the Holy Spirit to guide you in that and bless you with that. Be practical and sensible about this. Don't try to do everything all at one time. And that's a much healthier and more productive way to develop this a spiritual devotional life. Okay? Recognize that there are, going to become, there are going to be obstacles and work to overcome those obstacles. You're going to be interrupted, distracted, there's going to be noise, especially when you live in our house. Um, not from inside our house, but from outside our house. We have construction going on across the street from us, and I don't know what zoo those guys used to live at. <laughs> Am I kidding? It sounds like Very a funny. monkey house. It does. It <laughs> this kind of stuff all day long. <laughs> I mean, it's, like, it's like a rodeo. I mean, it's like these guys are in a rodeo. And the thing is, where they are is about 25 yards, if that much, from my office. And there's nothing in between us because I'm on the third floor. They're over there, and I'm going, oh, Lord, please, can I finish that thing already? Okay, so, never mind, okay, we're, I'm back. Um, 
Noise, frustrations, lack of family support, no sense of fulfillment at first. All of those are the kind of obstacles. And when, you, when you're confronted with one of those, recognize it. Ask God to help you with it. Pray through it. Keep moving forward. All right? The point is, I don't try to have uh, my devotional time it, after 9 o'clock in the morning when those guys are there whooping and hollering and sounding like the zoo. I do it at 5.30 in the morning, you know, downstairs where it's quiet. So we've got, we've got to have some sense of, you know, some good sense about that. And keep a record. Journaling, we've not talked a lot about that. That is one of the disciplines that some people recognize. Journaling is a very powerful way to grow. It's a way to remember what, you know, what you've experienced. To be able to go back and, and by, just by writing it down, we experience something in a completely different way. The reason why I talk to you and I have PowerPoints is because People learn and retain things in different ways. This is part of the, the whole uh, didactic theory, teaching theory. Um, if, you, if I only talked to you or I only had you reading PowerPoints, you would not retain nearly as much as if I do both. Well, when you write something, that solidifies things even more in your mind and, and self. And so keeping a journal, writing the things that you're experiencing, the answers to prayer, the questions that you have, that act will make it more a part of who you are. And it's very powerful. I say here, try journaling in both directions. One of the things that I've done is I have a journal book, and I will write, you know, like from, from devotional times, I will write in the front of it what I'm learning, what questions I have, you know, a, a, a journal, and then turn it over, and I'll open the back cover, and I will have the prayer list. And I work from the back page in on the prayer list and from the front front page in on my journaling and so I'm all I always know where I am and that way your prayer list isn't buried somewhere in you know 19 pages back in your journal you can always get to it right away that's something you might want to consider and to keep a list of things to pray for and not all of the things being for you right? um, we'll talk about again in a second the acts prayer you know adoration confession thanksgiving supplication the acts prayer a wonderful, simple way to pursue a more meaningful prayer life, uh, but to keep a prayer list, you know, of things you're thankful for, of ways in which you have seen the glory and grace of God that you want to praise Him for, thanks things things that uh, other people have needs for and your own needs as well. C.S. Lewis, quote C.S. Lewis all the time. There's a reason for that. He's that good. Uh, Lewis. After he started becoming quite famous, you know, Chronicles of Narnia were published and started getting well known, and the, his his radio talks, which together became Your Christianity, uh, you know, he was a spokesperson on the BBC during the Second World War, and so a lot of people heard his voice, and he got to start be, started becoming quite famous. Well, a lot of people started writing to him, and they would write to him, and often they would say, "Would you pray for me?" You know, for this whatever this is, and Lewis would add them to his prayer list. Those people that were close to C.S. Lewis said, once somebody got on his prayer list, they never were taken off. He prayed for those people for the rest of his life. Which gives you an idea how much time he must have spent in prayer. But when, when somebody asked Lewis to pray for them, he took it very seriously, and he never stopped praying for them. Okay? Uh, I think we can do better than we do. Rich? When, do you, when do you journal? Well, usually I will journal. I do computer stuff in the afternoons. I I've, I've got kind of a kind of a weird connection. Um, I usually do not do it when I'm when I'm studying. I usually get up first. I'm downstairs. You all have heard this. I give the dog his treat. Used to be two dogs. It's only one now. And make a cup of coffee. I sit and I read scripture and meditate on it. Pray about it. Usually somewhere in that process, Carol will come in. And she'll sit in the other chair in the, in the room, and she will, you know, she studies. She keeps her journal then. I usually keep mine later, okay, because I let things sink in. It's also true that I'm a little bit of a different case because I'm, I'm studying and writing every day, you know, and not, and, and like when I say every day, it's like six or eight hours a day uh, for the most part doing this kind of stuff, okay, or sermons or classes. And so much of my stuff are things that I capture while I'm going through that process. I don't recommend that to you, and I'm not excusing this. If I was not doing it to that level and that intensity, then I would be doing this because I used to do this. Okay. Um, this is what I think is a good way for people to, to get involved in it. But you, that's another thing. is the Holy Spirit works with each of us individually, and you may find your own approach to it. Just don't find 
you just don't not do it and then say, well, that's God's approach. <laughs> so, but, so journaling is a daily. Exactly. In fact, I'm going to mention in a second that a, good, a healthy way, I think, to think about this is there are dailies and weeklies. I didn't make that up. Somebody else did. There are certain disciplines that you should practice daily. Reading God's Word, uh, meditating on God's Word, praying, journaling should be daily things. But then a more in-depth study of God's Word and fasting and some of the others are things you should think about doing on a weekly basis. You know, obviously you try to fast every day, it wouldn't last too long, you know? Uh, unless it was just skipping, you know, one meal regularly or something like that. So yeah, there are, a, a good way to think about it is there are certain disciplines you should be pursuing on a daily basis, some a weekly basis, and some of them, like simplicity, may be something that you want to see as more of a life goal. And just, just pray about how can you kind of measure your progress toward that as you go along. Um, all right, I'm going to go five more minutes and then you can take the test. Realities of devotional life. First, start with modest expectations. This is what I was saying. Don't expect to have it all figured out by Tuesday. Don't try to do it all at once. You know, be understanding that you have to work your way into this. Secondly, understand there will be obstacles and it will sometimes feel like hard work. The devil doesn't like you doing this. And he will put obstacles in your way. But if you are constantly reminding yourself that God desires this and you desire this, so who the heck does the devil think he is? Okay? If you and God are agreed that you want to grow in this, then you can, but you are going to have to overcome some obstacles, like those monkeys across the street. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure they're wonderful guys. Just having, just having a good time they're while they work. Happy. They're very happy. Uh, third, your goals should include moving from reading or even studying the Bible to hearing God's voice in Scripture and interacting with it, and then to experience God in all parts of your life. Again, through fasting, silence, solitude, stewardship, service, and some of the others. Start with the part that we all should have started with, and yet too, too few Christians do. Reading God's Word daily, meditating on it, which simply means saying, what is God saying to me in this? That's what meditating on Scripture means, is what is God saying to me here? And then to go from that to a time of prayer, I think reading God's Word and meditating on it should lead us into prayer. And then from there, as that is the foundation of our spiritual life, our devotional life, we then begin to practice some of the other disciplines, fasting, silence, solitude, stewardship, uh, service, etc. Okay. Fourth, plan your devotional life in terms of daily and weekly commitments, as I say. There are some things, Bible study, meditation, prayer, journaling, you should do every day. You should set aside some time every day. If it's, a, if it's an hour, great. If it's a half an hour, fine. And again, don't. if you are not a morning person, then do not listen to all those people who always used to say, you have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and do this. Because if you're going, <laughs> then you're not gaining anything. If you're not a morning person, then do it at 10 o'clock over a cup of tea. Or do it you know, right after lunch. Or do it right after your afternoon nap, or whenever works for you, but set aside time that you can make this a real priority. Don't do it, don't do it at some time when you're not going to... See, I am a morning person. Even if I don't set my alarm, 6 o'clock is sleeping in for me. Okay? This morning I slept till 6.20 because I didn't set my alarm, but I didn't go to bed till after 11 o'clock. So, uh, that's... I get up early, and I've just gotten used to it. It's not because I'm in some way more righteous. It's just that my body's gotten used to that, so it wakes itself up. So whatever works for you, that's the time that works for me. It's pre-monkey time, so I can get I can, I can read and pray at that time. Okay. Uh, fifth, don't forget to pray. People forget the praying part. Before you read God's Word, ask Him to open it to you, to affect you with it, to bless you, to understand it, then, then study the Word, meditate on it, and then pray again. The Acts prayer is a great way to focus yourself. And I say here, pray out, try praying out loud. Again, that idea that diff, the use of different senses, ears, eyes, whatever, when you pray out loud, for many people, that helps them stay focused because you're hearing what you say, and it helps you keep your attention on it. All right? That may not be something that you find beneficial, but many people it is. Now, don't do that while you're standing out loud while you're standing in line at Super Lake, <laughs> or they may have you picked up. All right? Good then we have to use some common sense about this. Sixth, learn to worship God through praise and adoration. 
This is something most people are very uncomfortable with. I think some people are uncomfortable in our church services. When I start out with a prayer of adoration and I say things like, Lord, we worship you. We adore you. We praise you because you are worthy. And yet that's what it means. Worship means to acknowledge that God is worthy. Worthship. That he is worthy of our praise and adoration. The worthship of God. And so we need to learn to do that. And you can do it in silence and do it until you feel comfortable with it. Even if it feels awkward at first. Praise God for who he is and for what he does. Those are the two ways that we can give praise to God. For who he is. He is the great God Almighty who made everything. He is the creator God and the redeemer God. And praise him for what he has done. He has not only made the world and redeemed the world, he's redeemed me. He sent his own son. I can, I can praise him for who he is and for what he has done. Okay? Then uh, learn to listen to God. Remember, this is a conversation. We need to listen more than we talk. Ask God to speak to us and then pay attention because sometimes he speaks immediately. Now, I've shared that before, and I've actually had people in this class come back to me and said, once they became aware of that, they realized that was happening to them. That they would say, Lord, I'm not sure what to do here. And then they knew. Right then. God said something to them. Okay? So listen. Learn to appreciate silence. Again, too many of us, if there's not a radio playing, or there's not a TV on, or there's not some sound, we're not comfortable. Well, you know what? If you're not comfortable with silence... That's especially why you need to learn to experience silence. And experience God in silence, especially. Okay. Things like that that we're uncomfortable with, that may be the Holy Spirit's way of saying, hey, you need to pay attention here. There's a problem. We need to learn the power of keeping a written journal. Okay. And then seek to grow in the disciplines of fasting, silence, solitude, service, and stewardship. As additional disciplines, starting with the foundation of... Prayer, studying God's Word, meditating on God's Word, and then begin, and I recommend that you identify one of those, fasting or silence perhaps, that you begin to add um, solitude, spending time by yourself, look for opportunities for Christian service, stewardship. If you're not giving of your financial resources, that doesn't matter if it's a little or if it's a lot, if you are not giving a, some proportional amount, a tenth, there's no law about giving a tenth, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb. There's no reason not to start there. And if you can't give a tenth because you just can't, you have other obligations, then ask God to bring you to the place where you can give a tenth. And start, it's called a graduated tithe, where you may say to God, God, how much I have coming in and how much I have obligated to go out, I can't give a tenth right now. I can give a fifth, and I'm going to try to, in a year or two years or five years, get to the place where I can give a tenth. And I ask you to bless me and direct me so that I can Many times when we say we can't give a tenth or we can't give whatever we feel God's laying on our heart, it's because we confuse what we need with what we want. Okay? And so I think we need to be careful about that. But commit yourself to try to reach a point where you are giving a significant, you know, something that's substantial. I told you C.S. Lewis when somebody asked him how much should I give. Lewis said, I, I don't know exactly how much we should give, except it needs to be more than... Um, What's comfortable? Uh, well, you can spare. What you can spare, that's what it was. I just I, I quoted before and it just wasn't going to say it. It should be more than you can spare. Meaning it should be something that means a real commitment. Not just easy breezy. Not just a gratuity. God doesn't want your tips. And you don't get ben you don't get blessed or benefit when you only give God your tips. Any questions about any of that? Shall I close in prayer? Just kidding. You have a test today. <laughs> <laughs>